Wisconsin, and <laughs> hopefully it warms up later this week. I know there's a lot of people that are on spring break, so we hope everyone enjoys themselves who, who've come down here to visit. I'm here, uh, pleased to be joined by a number of people today for today's announcement. First, Taryn Bragdon. He's the founder and CEO of the Foundation for Government Accountability based in Naples. Uh, John Rothell, Senior Director of Government Affairs for Florida at the League of Southeastern Credit Unions. And Dr. Pete Windham, a dentist here from Panama City. So if you look at what's happening with our economy, we had starting in 2020, uh, massive fiscal stimulus, and that ended up being trillions and trillions of dollars over, over a couple years. The Fed reduced uh, interest rates to basically zero, pumped a lot of money into the economy, and that led to inflation. And I think almost anyone who was looking at what was going on over the last many years would have said that, that inflation was the likely result of those policies. Now, the Fed itself when it was clear that we were seeing an inflationary upturn, said that it was transitory, that this was something that would just work itself out. And so they did not act when uh, they should have. They got behind the curve. And so as inflation continued to spike and continue to be a huge problem for our economy, they responded by hiking rates very, very rapidly, very, very quickly. Uh, that's done a lot of things to hurt a lot of people, but it has put a lot of pressure on the banking sector in particular. And so we had recently this issue with the Silicon Valley Bank, which was bailed out. I mean, this is a bank that uh, had invested in a lot of uh, long-term bonds that were no longer profitable because the interest rates have gone up. They also did things like focused a lot on uh, ESG and DEI and, and didn't do appropriate risk management. Uh, so they ended up being a situation where they were insolvent and so the Fed, because this is a bank that is very politically connected with people in Silicon Valley, uh, the Fed and the Treasury Department bailed it out. Now, they try to say it's not a bailout because they say it's going to be paid for by banking fees. But who pays the banking fees? Customers. So you're going to pay more for fees to do banking uh, in order to give the Silicon Valley people a bailout. Now, there was not a sy uh, systemic risk to the economy from this one bank, but they were uh, politically connected. And here's the thing. When you engage in those types of policies like we've seen over many years, someone is going to have to pay the bill. Uh, ultimately, the bill comes due. And so what they've now done in the last couple weeks is they've printed another $300 billion dollars and injecting that into the economy. Now, the problem with that is they spent the last year trying to take money out of the economy with their raising interest rates uh, uh, very rapidly. And so just what they've done since you've seen the hiccups in the banking is they've wiped out half of the reduction in the money supply that they had worked for the last year to achieve, all to be able to benefit uh, some of these uh, politically connected banks. And so what they're doing is they're, quote, fighting inflation and, and managing the economy in ways that make it more difficult for you, for average people, but are shielding the banks from the pain associated with the policies. And my question is, are you interested in giving these economic central planners more power over our economy, more power over your uh, daily life and your economic activity? Uh, and I answer that question, uh, H-E double, double hockey sticks, no, we cannot have that happening. And so that's why we're here today, because we've seen a lot of mismanagement uh, from the economic central planners. It's just by nature. You cannot do this effectively without there being major costs uh, to pay. And so some want to increase power to these organizations such as the Federal Reserve. And so last year, President Biden issued an executive order to explore the creation of a U.S. central bank digital currency, effectively converting the dollar into a centralized digital currency. And this is different than things like cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. A centralized digital currency is directly controlled and issued uh, to, uh, by the government to consumers. And it provides the government with a direct view 
of all consumer activities. And so this is something that is being proposed as somehow being environmentally sustainable, a uh, way to increase access to consumers who lack the means to join a traditional bank. But as we've come to learn, uh, any way they can get into society uh, to exercise their agenda, they will do it. So what the central bank digital currency is all about is surveilling Americans and controlling behavior of Americans. And how do we know? Because we've seen this happen in other parts of the world. Look at no further than China to see the impacts of centralized digital currency. The People's Bank of China uses its central bank to monitor citizen behavior, allowing for the surveillance of spending habits and to cut off access to goods and services. You also see things in the uh, Bahamas where they've instituted caps on CBDC holdings and transactions. In Nigeria, central bank capped ATM withdrawals to forcibly push the use of their digital currency in lieu of physical currency. And I don't even need to think here, what are they going to want to do, these ESG factors? You go and buy gasoline. If you bought too much gasoline, they just won't allow you to use this to make a transaction. Who knows whether they would let you buy a firearm or things that they disapprove of. And so you're opening up a major can of worms and you're handing a central bank huge, huge amounts of, of power. And they will use uh, that power. I think if we've seen anything over the last four or five years is uh, if they can do their agenda, they will do their agenda in any way that they can. I mean, just think about some of the stuff that's happened with the, with the whole banking situation. You know, the deposits are protected by law up to 250000 Above that, it's not protected. Congress never changed that law, and yet somehow the administration, the Fed, the Treasury, they're removing that cap for some of these banks. And so the law is not really going to be an impediment to them if they can get the central bank digital currency. They will use that in ways that, that benefit their agenda. So today uh, we're here because... We now recognize there's a concerted effort across America to backdoor provisions for the use of C, uh, central bank digital currency through individual state uniform commercial codes, UCC. Uniform commercial codes intended to provide for standard governing laws for commercial transactions across state lines and is set by an independent commission of, quote, experts to seek uniformity in state laws. Now, while legislation to apply recent recommended changes to the UCC has, in, has been introduced in about 20 states, no bill has been introduced in the Florida legislature, and if they were to pass a bill, I would veto that bill. Uh, however, given the risks associated with the federally sanctioned centralized bank of digital currency, uh, today uh, I'm here to call on the legislature to pass legislation to expressly forbid the use of CBDC as money within Florida's Uniform Commercial Code. This will ensure that Florida continues to be a state that supports innovation in the financial sector through the market uh, while protecting against government surveillance over your personal finances. But our legislation shouldn't stop there. Given the continued increase in Chinese influence in worldwide affairs and increase in plans to adopt CBDC worldwide, our legislation also prohibits any CBDC issued by a foreign reserve or government-sanctioned central bank. This will ensure that any effort to adopt a worldwide digital currency will never occur in the free state of Florida. And finally, I'm calling on like-minded states uh, like Florida uh, to uh, adopt similar legislation uh, into their uniform commercial codes and to reject any changes to their uniform commercial code that would formally recognize a central bank digital currency. And I've already spoken with uh, Lieutenant Governor of Texas, who's the head of the, the Senate in Texas. I do believe Texas is going to do something similar to what Florida does. And if we can get a groundswell of states to say no, uh, we are not going to turn over this power to you. I mean, look, ultimately, cash is king. I mean, if you can hold it in your hand... You have power over that. The minute it's all digitized, somebody else is going to have control over that, and it's just a question of are they going to let you live your life or are they going to decide to do things uh, to circumvent uh, what you want to do. And think about what we've already seen. In Canada, you remember when the truckers were protesting the vax mandates 
you know, they had banks. Some of the, the government seized some, froze some of their banks. You had charities that were trying to help these guys, and that was frozen. So we've already seen government really overstep its bounds as it is in the, in the banking situation and financial sector that we have now. Can you imagine if we went to something like a central bank digital currency? So I'm glad that we're uh, at the tip of the sphere on this. I think it's really important that states stand up to fight back against some of the things um, that are going on, well, most of the things that are going on right now in Washington, uh, because they don't have your best interests at heart. Uh, they have their own power at heart. Uh, they have their own agenda that they're looking to advance. And so I think this will be great legislation. I look forward. We're already talking to the leaders in the legislature. I think this is something that is going to happen, and I look forward to being able to sign it into law uh, later this year. Okay, we're going to hear from some of our speakers. Taryn Bragdon, you're up. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for your leadership and the continued pushback against an overreaching federal government. You know, our money says, in God we trust. But the central bank digital currency would change that to in government we trust. It's wrong. And as the governor talked about, it will give the Federal Reserve unprecedented power over how we spend our money. It seems like the Biden administration is really taking a page from the Chinese Communist Party's playbook where they use digital currency as a weapon of power and control. And that scheme, as the governor noted, controls where the Chinese can live, eat, work, and play. President Biden has made it clear over and over again, the goal is control. And this is simply the latest ploy to deprive Americans of their liberty. We must not allow unelected, woke bureaucrats to have complete control over our finances and our lives, further eroding our privacy and civil liberties. The governor's proposal today will protect Floridians and serve as a model for the rest of the country. Thank you, Governor, for continuing to make Florida a beacon of freedom in our country. Okay, John. Thank you, Governor. As a Senior Governmental Affairs Director for the League of Southeastern Credit Unions, um, I appreciate the Governor bringing this issue to the forefront. Our organization represents over 300 credit unions in Alabama, Florida, and Georgia, over 11 million members in those three states. Consumers should have a choice on where they put their hard-earned money. They should have a choice where they go to get a loan, to get their first mortgage, their, car, their first car loan. And as, unfortunately, as proposed, we have concerns with a central bank currency that would crush the, the role of community financial, based, financial institutions like credit unions and our ability to serve our members and our communities as they do in this area. In contrast, how, do, how consumers interact with financial institutions today, retail centralized uh, digital currency being proposed by the, federal, by the Fed could bypass financial institutions like our credit unions and go directly to consumers meaning our, our community credit unions would see a drastic reduction in our ability to offer loans and lines of credit to our members and communities. Today, Americans rely on a safe and secure financial system in which funds are readily available when a consumer needs them, and this is already done digitally. Rather than continue to support uh, com uh, commercial and not-for-profit financial institutions like credit unions, that are innovating, finding new products and services, small businesses to centralize control, or, um, this would bypass those homegrown small businesses to centralize control over the financial uh, system. A federally adopted CBDC could provide government access to consumer accounts, increase problems with liquidity for institutions, making access to capital more difficult for consumers, particularly in an economic downturn. Fortunately, we're lucky to have Governor DeSantis, who recognizes that a federally controlled CBDC could hinder, hinder innovation, cut jobs, and risk the hard-earned money Floridians and Americans work for each and every day. And we appreciate everything he does for, this, for the great state of Florida. All right. Thank 
Okay, Dr. Dr. Wyndham. You know, Governor, if you if you get to be my age, you don't need reading glasses. <laughs> Thank you uh, for allowing me to come and speak this morning. Uh, sometimes I, I wonder about who my friends really are, Chuck Perdue, <laughs> uh, who, who somehow got me uh, up here to speak. And the topic that uh, the governor touched on is one that uh, it, really, it, it really hits home with me. And, uh, Governor, I would like to thank you for your leadership, your vision, and for your taking a stand for what America is about. Sure. Uh, y'all, y'all may not know, but politics is not fun. <laughs> and uh, our governor is standing alone. Uh, this is off script, Governor, and I apologize. But he's standing alone in the United States against an enemy, and it is our own government. And hearing these men speak today, it resonates with me because uh, I've had many family members who have served in the United States military, and they served for a purpose, and that purpose was to keep the United States free and to stand for what we as a nation have traditionally been throughout the world. And that's exactly what our governor stands for. And I'm proud to say that he, he is my governor. And I'm proud to say that my family would be proud of you today. And most of those have died. My dad passed away a year ago. And he loved you. <laughs> I mean, he said, where's this guy been? <laughs> He said, what, what took so long for somebody to wake up? You know, they, you asked me to speak today about gun ownership. Yes, I own guns. If I lived in California, I'd be classified as a felon. But I live in Florida. And uh, Sheriff Ford promised that he wouldn't disclose some of my firearms, so I'm not going to disclose any of his. <clears throat> but in Texas, what I have, they would call a good start. <laughs> uh, but I can't live in Texas. I've been there, done that. You know, it is quite concerning for me that our federal government, they believe that they can take and tell us what we can buy, what we can't buy through digital currency. And it is a topic that uh, is relatively unknown to me until just recently. I have seen in my profession in dentistry and in a gun collector, I have seen... Uh, Regulation upon regulation upon regulation, which just, it, it, it's almost become prohibitory to exist in the United States. And so when we talk about controlling currency, uh, I think we all understand that it's all about money. Everything's about money. And if you control the money, you control the people. You know, our governor understands this, and he gets this. And he's putting the word out. And I was glad to hear, uh, I'm, I'm not shocked that you're leading, you know, the way with other states. And thank you for that. But if you think about what you endure every day in your daily lives, and I know in my dental practice, we have, uh, from the time I started 38 years ago, we have had regulation upon regulation upon regulation. And we abide by that because I enjoy what I do. And so when we talk about control, if you control the money, you control the people. And I believe that's basically what you're saying. 
And I don't know about y'all, but I kind of would like to have control of my own money. And I'd like to have control of where I spend it. And so, Governor, I, I can't thank you enough for what you, what you do for our state, uh, what your leadership means to our people, and uh, just keep on fighting because I believe you'll find that the vast majority of the Floridians and I'm going to say this, the vast majority of Americans are for what you believe in. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I thank you. Thank you. And I do think if you look at how other things are going on by using the economy to advance a political agenda, we have this idea of ESG, environment, social governance, which is basically just a veneer uh, to, for people to use banks, financial institutions, the economy to advance an ideological agenda. And it's an agenda that is trying to impose really leftism on the country. Uh, they've gone after gun owners, dealers. Uh, they go, go after people that, that they don't like to try to marginalize them. So we've actually been one of the leading states in fighting back against that. We're going to enact protections uh, for Floridians against being discriminated against by these big financial institutions based on your religious practices, your, your political affiliation, because it seems that this is a one-way ratchet where they're trying to marginalize people on the other side of the political spectrum. So this C, uh, central bank digital currency is I think a huge part, but it's only one part of an overall movement uh, to try to use the levers of economic power uh, to control society and to impose an agenda on society. Mind you, an agenda that would not be able to win at the ballot box uh, in society. Uh, so these are people that are trying to make an end run around that process and they want to be able to impose their worldview on our society without being held accountable uh, by any type of an electorate and that is wrong. And this idea of a central bank digital currency uh, is also wrong. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, Megan from the Florida Standard. Uh, we wanted to know what your thoughts are on the rumored Trump indictment and if you have any role in it. Um, if charges are brought on him, would you have any role in extradition to New York? So I've seen rumors swirl. I have not seen any facts uh, yet, and so I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this. The, the Manhattan district attorney is a Soros-funded prosecutor. And so he, like other Soros-funded prosecutors, they weaponize their office to impose a political agenda on society at the expense of the rule of law and public safety. He has downgraded over 50 percent of the felonies to misdemeanors. He says he doesn't want to even have jail time for the vast, vast majority of crimes. And what we've seen in Manhattan is we've seen the, sky, the, the crime rate go up and we've seen citizens become less safe. And so you're talking about this situation with, and look, I don't know what goes into paying hush money to a porn star to, to secure silence over some type of alleged affair. I just, I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is that if you have a prosecutor who is ignoring crimes happening every single day in his jurisdiction, and he chooses to go back many, many years ago uh, to try to use something about po porn star hush money payments, you know, that's an example of pursuing a political agenda and weaponizing the office. And um, I think that that's fundamentally wrong. I also think it's important to point out when you're talking about these Soros-funded prosecutors, yes, they may do a high-profile politicized prosecution, uh, and that's bad, but the real victims are ordinary New Yorkers, ordinary Americans in all these different jurisdictions, that they get victimized every day because of the reckless political agenda that these Soros DAs bring to their job. They ignore crime and they empower criminals, and that hurts people. It hurts a lot of people every single day. The Soros district attorneys are a menace to society, and I'm just glad that I'm the only governor in the country that's actually removed one from office during my tenure. <laughs> and in terms of um, our, 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 we are not involved in this, won't be involved in this, 
Uh, I have no interest in getting involved in some type of manufactured circus by some Soros DA, okay? He's trying to do a political spectacle. He's trying to virtue signal for his base. Uh, I've got real issues I got to deal with here in the state of Florida. We're obviously shutting down uh, CBDC, which is important. We've got so many things pending in front of the legislature. Uh, I've got to spend my time on issues that actually matter to people. Uh, I can't spend my time uh, worrying about uh, things, things of that nature. So, so we're not going to be involved in it in any way. Um, I'm fighting for Floridians, and I'm fighting back against Biden. That's what I do every single day. Yep. Governor, um, another question in terms of that. Are you aware if there has been any communication between Florida law enforcement and New York authorities if they do indict and President Trump does not go to New York for arraignment? Discussions about how he may be arraigned here in Florida since he resides here. Are you aware of any? I'm not aware of anything. Can we talk money for one more minute? Yes. I, if SVB was to tip the iceberg, and it was, we know there's a rot throughout the banking system, and that the cumulative effects of the rate hikes have barely felt. I mean, we're just getting there, you know. How safe is Florida's pension fund? Because pension funds, banks, they're probably all upside down in their treasuries. What can you tell the people who may be wondering how far this thing is going to go if SVB was the SVB was the kicker? Well, look, I mean, I think SVB was was a little bit unique. I mean, this was the average deposit at SVB. I think was. Uh, millions of dollars, right? What's the average bank account in the United States? It's probably about five or six thousand dollars. And so these are very high-powered individuals. A lot of them involved with venture capitalists. And this was kind of the bank of choice that people would go to. So these are very sophisticated people. Uh, they made decisions to put put their money there. I can tell you this: if you look back at their financials at SVB. This was not something that, that should have been a surprise. I mean, you saw what the strategy was in terms of where they had put so much money. I think part of what happened was they got so many deposits flowed in once COVID happened that their bank you know, really, really got bigger. But there was mismanagement on part of the bank, and it wasn't just because the interest rates were, were rapidly uh, uh, increased. Yeah, that, that had a lot to do with it. Clearly, if the Fed would have identified the inflation earlier, they could have probably done this with a lot less pain. But you also have to look at, I mean, there was trillions of dollars printed, trillions of dollars appropriated by Congress over the last several years. Uh, this was going to happen to where you were going to have an inflationary period. There's just no way you can do that. There's no free lunch. I mean, if we could just print money to solve all the world's problems, why would we even show up? I mean, let's just let them print. We'll just sit at home, you know, hang out all day. Why? It just doesn't work. And so there's going to have to be uh, a reckoning. And the question is, should that reckoning be imposed on average people where the banks are, are held, um, you know, where they get special benefits and special bailouts? Or should some of these banks who've made bad decisions be the ones? And, and I just think that when you're – Having an economy, uh, ultimately, to, to do a bailout like that, it's going to cause more problems in the long term than, than it's solving, uh, no matter how this stuff shakes out. So I do think that uh, you're seeing this across regional banks. You know, Florida wasn't necessarily a focal point, but, I mean, there's obviously banks here. The whole sector has gone down. Uh, some of that, I think, is, is fear, uh, but some of that is, is a realization that when you have the, the rate hikes the way they've gone, a lot of these banks were invested in, in very low-yield, long-term uh, bonds, and the result has been uh, the balance sheet has been upended. Yes? Uh, on the central bank digital currency, has the Biden administration made any recent move towards moving towards that? So they did an executive order to do, like, a study of it, and the idea was that I think most people assumed that there was going to be some study that is returned that, that advocates for it. And then the issue would be, is that something that Congress would ever adopt? Or could they just try to do it through the Fed without Congress being involved? You know, we've, we've evolved into a constitutional system where uh, you have the federal government kind of just does things that it wants to do, regardless of whether Congress actually appropriates that. That is not the way our system was designed. That's not the way you have a government that's accountable to the public. But we have vast swaths of power that are being exercised over our society from the Fed, Treasury, FDIC, the administrative state, uh, that none of these people are elected. 
None of these people are really accountable. Congress doesn't hold them accountable. We know that. Uh, and so I think that that's very, very dangerous. And so I think they would have to do this through Congress, but I wouldn't put anything past them. And I think if enough states come up and say no, I think it's going to be really difficult for Congress to ever uh, enact something like this uh, by statute. Then the issue will be is if they try to do it administratively, what are our recourses there? And, and, and believe me, Florida would fight back uh, if that were ever to come to pass. Yes? How often are you planning to protect um, Floridians' pockets, especially in the face of FPL rate hikes and stuff like that? Because this whole digital dollar is all talking about protecting Floridians' pockets. What other uh, plans? So, yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I mean, you know, this is, this is protecting your autonomy. This is protecting your freedom to make decisions. We don't want a central bank circumscribing your decisions. And we want to make sure that you have access to your money. Now, in terms of dealing with some of the, the pressures that we're seeing in terms of the inflation, which, again, was not transitory. Uh, it's still there. Uh, it's still hitting people. We're going to do uh, the biggest tax relief that we've ever done in Florida history. So we already did a, a big uh, uh, reduction for tolls for our commuters, which you know affects different parts of the state differently because some places have a lot, some places don't. Uh, but it's a fixed cost and really makes it difficult for commuters. So people are happy with that, that they've gotten those reduced by 50%. Now we're going to do a big tax package. In Florida, we're going to say for here on out permanently, no tax on any baby items. And so diapers, wipes, strollers, cribs, clothes for babies, that's on you. You get to do it, and the government's not going to tax you at all for that. And if you think about it, those are costs that you have to do. Like, you know, when you have a young child, like, you need diapers. Like, there's just no way around that. They go through them. you got to do this stuff. And so I think it's going to end up being really, really good. We're also going to do... Uh, permanent sales tax exclusion for over-the-counter pet medications. Uh, we're going to do a, a one-year sales tax holiday for a bunch of different things, all youth sports equipment, tax-free. We're going to do all pet food tax-free for, for one year. Uh, we're going to do a whole host of other tax relief so that you think about as a consumer the things that you have to spend money on. you got to spend money on your family and on your pets. Like There's no real way around that you're going to be able to do a lot of that tax-free. And so that's going to save people uh, hundreds of dollars, I think the average family, maybe even more, depending on how many kids you have, how many pets you have. So we're, we're excited about that. I think that that's going to be some, some uh, much-needed relief uh, for the people in the state of Florida. Okay, everybody, it was so good to see you guys. I want to come back next time. It's a little bit warmer, maybe, and we'll, uh, we'll go and have a good time. But God bless you all.